بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهل لنا أمورنا واشرح الصالحات أعمالنا وصدورنا لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين وأنت أرحم الراحمين so uh, in these uh, evening uh, classes so we have uh, two classes weekly one on tuesday another one on thursday so on tuesday we have uh, four meetings for four tuesdays so the first one is today and uh, the subject for tuesday's uh, classes uh, uh, is Quranic studies in Western academia. Uh, so I'll talk about this subject and divide everything uh, into these four meetings. So the subject, what we are going to focus here, we have three uh, specific uh, questions. So when, so we are going to focus on the end of the 19th century till now. And where, that's Western academia. And what, Quranic studies approaches followed by scholars and institutions. So there are some objectives uh, I hope to achieve during these uh, lectures and after. So the first one, mapping out the main Western perspectives on Quranic studies, scholars, institutions, time, and place trajectory. So we are going in the end. So I hope that we have, we will have uh, an information about the main uh, approaches in Western academia. So the subject, as you will see, we cannot uh, contain everything. Uh, the second objective uh, is knowing the resources in both of Islamic tradition and Western scholarly works. And the third one is to criticize based on traditional text and eliciting or to elicit uh, uh, new approaches based on this text. So however, before uh, delving into these uh, lectures, so as uh, Sheikh Amin said, so for four questions, uh, could be after one hour, but however, if there any uh, specific question connected to what we are doing here, especially on slides, feel free to ask me. So if you ask for any details or you ask about some uh, specific questions on these uh, slides, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, so we have some scholarly references. So most of these uh, references you know. So the first one, the famous book by Al-Azami, Mustafa Al-Azami, and in his book, The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation. So in uh, this a very uh, uh, useful book to understand the history of Quranic studies in Western academia and to address mostly the, I can say mostly the old, uh, uh, Western approaches. So there are some approaches followed right now not covered in this book. So I'm going to cover these uh, uh, perspectives based on my uh, experience, personal experience, and my reading. The second one uh, is an article, but it's a very good article by Joseph Lombard. Uh, the title of this uh, uh, the title of this uh, article, uh, De De uh, Decolonizing Quranic Studies. And also this uh, translated uh, into Arabic. So, and the Arab, uh, Arab uh, seekers and students are interested in this article specifically because uh, this article uh, 
uh, address a very important topic right now in Arab world. So there, there is an interest in Arab world right now in Edward Said and the colonial uh, subject, post-colonial subject, and all of these. And Joseph Lombard is known for you uh, for his book, The Study Quran. And this uh, article was a, a, a talk at SAWAS University on Quranic Conference. And the third one, a book written by Gabriel Said Reynolds, is a Lebanese, and he is a professor here in Notre Dame. And he wrote uh, two important books, and we are going to address this book in our uh, lectures. So the first one, the Quran and the uh, sub-biblical text. And the second one is just uh, came out by Yale Press, uh, the Quran and Bible. The fourth one uh, by Fred Donner, uh, professor at University of Chicago in his article, the Quran in recent scholarship. And in his article, this article specifically, he's, he, uh, he addressed the, the nature of Quranic studies in Western academia and he described the Quranic studies in Western academia as a chaos. So nothing organized. So anyone wants to, uh, to study Quranic studies or to have a look, so just has a result with like, no, no result. And then there is a, a, a review on Reynolds. I, I mentioned Reynolds, G uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds, uh, his book, The Quran and its Biblical Subtext. There is a very good review by Angelika Neuwert, a German scholar. And I can say right now is maybe a leading scholar in this subject in Western academia. Uh, and she is a professor at uh, Freie Berlin University in, in Germany. And she is very famous for uh, 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 an approach we, I, I'll mention later. And also there is uh, the Encyclopedia of Quran by Muzaffar Iqbal in his introduction and the, main, the whole book to address the, the problem of uh, Quranic studies in Western academia. And there is an article by uh, uh, Baraviz Manzur, or Man Manzur, Method Against Truth, Orientalism and Quranic Studies. Uh, mostly in this article, he ad addressed uh, the, the critical, uh, uh, the historical cr uh, criti uh, critical method by Western uh, scholars. And I mention here uh, an article, it seems not uh, close to what we are talking right now. So the return to philology by Edward Said. So why this connected here? So maybe I'll, I'll talk about this later. Why Edward Said and why the, the importance of philology right now and the history of philology in this, this field. And right now, what we talk about the new philology and the future of philology among Western scholars. So I'll talk about the term later. And I'll talk about the importance of this book and how Arab use this book and how Arab use philology as a counter to philology. So philology versus philology. So new philology versus old philology. And then there is uh, uh, by Jensen the, interpreta the interpretation of the Quran. Mostly he addressed uh, tafsir in modern time, and especially in Egypt. But in his introduction, there, is, uh, there are many, many good points to understand the Quranic studies in Western academia. And I put here Carbos Quranicum not as an article uh, or a book, but as uh, a da data on, online. Carbos Quranicum is a project in Germany, in the, in the south of Berlin, 
in the city called Botsdam. And this uh, initiative or this program initiated by the uh, German government, and there is a big fund with millions of dollars, and for 18 years to, uh, to work on the history of Quran. And I can say maybe the, the biggest uh, project on Quran in the West, Corpus Quranicum. And then there is uh, uh, another article by Mahdi Azayez, is uh, a Nigerian, and he is uh, also a scholar also, uh, teaching right now in France. He is uh, editing a book called The Quran, New Ap uh, Approaches in French. And he, uh, he uh, presented this book with an introduction and with a different uh, different approaches in this book. Uh, Neil uh, Robinson, in his Discovering the Quran, he uh, addressed many, many things. One of these things, he speaks about some traditional uh, approaches, or I can say modern approaches, by Amin Islahi and Farahi. So he, he, he talks about uh, so the Indian approach towards Quran. And uh, a famous book by uh, Michael Sells, Approaching the Quran. So just uh, introductory book to the Quran. We don't see um, speaking about Western academia, but we can. Many uh, scholars here use this book as a textbook to, uh, to focus on Quran or to cover Quranic studies in Western academia. And in the end, so I have two traditional sources, the main sources for our talk. The first one, as suyuti in his Al-Itqan fi Ulum Al-Qur'an. And with many uh, editions, the edition I have, uh, the edition I have, I think, four volumes or six volumes with 2,500 pages. I read these 2,500 pages. I reread this just for this course, just for these lectures, to how to, uh, to, to, uh, to discuss and criticize Western academia on Quran based on these traditions. And I'll talk about this later. And Al-Asiyuti, Al-Asiyuti's Itqan, uh, based mostly on Al-Zarkashi in his Burhan fi Ulum Al-Quran. So Al-Burhan fi Ulum Al-Quran and Al-Itqan fi Ulum Al-Quran, Al-Asiyuti, the main resources that we are, uh, or we build our criticism in these lectures. So for these lectures, we have a couple of questions. Maybe we ha you have more. You come to these lectures with some expectations and some questions, so please add. So maybe I'll open the floor after these questions if you have more of these questions or, but just like when I come here, when I talk about the Quran in Western Academia, what we can, what we, why we need that? So the first question, why the Quran is a matter for Western academia? This is a very important question. Why Quran right now in some universities, in some departments, you can see Quran taught at divinity or religious department or Jewish studies or history or anthropology, many departments in Western academia. So why the Quran is a matter for Western academia? This is a question, I hope we have an answer for this. And do we need, as a Muslim community, to address this subject? This is a very important question. So when I came here to US after one year um, from Syria, so in Syria we don't know anything about LGBTQ, or all of this stuff. So one student asked me at University of Chicago, asked me about this. 
and I said, this based on hikmah, wisdom. So you don't need to address anything. The audience is not interested. But if you are in a society or a context, you cannot just ignore. You need to talk about this in a very good way, an obvious way. And here, why we are talking about Quranic in Western academia. So you are here in the West, and you need to talk about this. And maybe you have some, maybe the second generation or the third generation here, they will ask you. And they have a lot of questions from maybe professors at universities. So we need to know our tradition. It's not about like our ideas or our thoughts, our impressions. I'm good, I'm bad, I, I agree or not agree. We need to build our tradition. We need to address all of these questions based on traditions. And this is very important for us. So when we are in the society, address all of these subjects, then we need to add this subject and or to ignore that's based on wisdom. Did or do Muslim scholars in Arab world address the subject? So if you go to uh, the Arab library, they talk about Western academia and what X and Y, talking about Quranic studies. Yes. Yes, and that's the, uh, this uh, shift started with uh, 19th century. So the first encounter between uh, Western scholars and Eastern scholars, we witnessed by, with Golzi here and Sheikh Tahir al-Jazairi. They uh, send messages and ask questions, and that's in 19th century and uh, onward. So now we see the interest in Western academia in, in Arab world, especially in, uh, in some countries in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia. And they invite uh, Western scholars to talk about Quran and Quranic studies there. There are some Western scholars famous for Arab world, and especially in some liberal uh, cities like Beirut or maybe Cairo, Tunis, they invited, and there are some like some groups. They are they know many things about Western academia and Quranic studies uh, more than maybe Muslims here. And what their met methods to address these issues? So we can see different people. Some like just like traditional and ignore everything from the West. We don't need to talk about anything coming from the West. And others, so that's, I can recall when I, the first uh, PhD, when I, 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 I wanted to write my PhD was uh, Dr. Utter, and I said, I, I want to focus on uh, Orientalist perspective on Hadith and Quran. And he said, it's a very important topic, so go for it. But when I submit the proposal, the university rejected. We don't need to talk about this. And I understand. That's, yeah, I understand the environment and everything. But Dr. Atur said that because I understood from Dr. Atur when say yes, that's not, uh, not yes for everyone. And no, not no for everyone based on if you are if you understand what you what you want to do and understand what what uh, how you can deal with this yes you can do it so mostly in uh, in arab world so they ignore the subject or they accept the subject or in the middle but mostly they criticize western academia based on uh, not as holistic approach. They didn't provide uh, holistic uh, criticism. They criticized this point and that point. This scholar uh, uh, maybe made a mistake here and there. And speaking about motivations, intentions, 
and not focusing on the text. That's what we see mostly in Arab universities when we speak about Western academia. And why is the subject addressed here in Darul Qasim? So, as um, Isam, I'm from Syria, and Darul Qasim is a very traditional place. I'm coming from Vanderbilt University. Uh, I'm teaching there at the Department of Re Religious Studies. So, why Darul Qasim? Darul Qasim is very important for this subject because here we are going to address all of these perspectives based on tradition. So we will not talk about this bad or not. So we, uh, we are going to map out all of these approaches and then we will go to traditions and read some text. And based on these texts, we can see how we can, maybe we have answers, we don't have answers, and I cannot promise that I have answers for everything. So when we read, you can see you have, maybe you have some answers more than me. Why I'm personally interested in this subject? When I left Syria, uh, I got a post-doctoral fellowship at Corpus Quranicum. So I worked with a group of Corpus Quranicum in Berlin, in Potsdam, on the the history of Quran. So I worked there one year, and I I was there and I witnessed everything about manuscripts, the history, and how they map out everything, the data, and the methodology. And that's very important for me in my life to to see how uh, these scholars. So I I work personally with Angelica Neuvert there, and with all scholars working on Semitic languages in Syriac, Hebrew, Aramaic, and all Arabian languages. And also after that, I went to University of Chicago Divinity School to teach for two years Quranic Arabic. So I worked with Dr. Michael Sell there, and I taught Quranic Arabic there, and also I'm, I'm, I'm teaching right now at Vanderbilt Quranic Arabic and Classical Arabic. Uh, are Western scholars interested in Muslim criticism. Okay, so now we find some Arab researchers writing on this. So anyone from here, Western scholars reading what we, what Arab like writing and Muslim writing, I don't see that. So we, we need to, 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 to think about all of these questions. So, uh, so I don't see any like uh, Western scholar cited or cites anything like from Arab scholar, except these scholars who approaching Quran like in modernity eyes or liberal eyes, liberal lens, like in Egypt, Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid, in uh, in in Tunisia. Uh, Abdul Majid al-Sharafi in Morocco, Muhammad Abid al-Jabiri, all of these scholars right now who are criticizing Quran and uh, uh, working on the history of Quran, they are very good resources and all Western scholars cite them. And the main scholar right now is Muhammad Shahroor. Muhammad Shahroor is a Syrian uh, engineer right now and he is presenting a TV show in Dubai on Quran and interpre interpretation on Quran without Sunnah, Sunnah is neglected and Quran and has a very big audience and this uh, initiative by UAE on how make Quran relative to our world. So Muhammad Shahroud's a whole book his whole book translated into English, and there are some uh, criticism uh, on his book, one by Karim al who is who was working at Taba Foundation, who criticized uh, Muhammad Shahroor's uh, approach. And why most, uh, most Western approaches don't attract Muslims? So in the end, there are a lot of books, works written in English, but 
in mean uh, uh, meanwhile we don't see this attraction uh, in, in 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 Arab world so they are not interested so uh, like when anyone like let me say about like Nolke or about uh, anyone uh, written by Angelica Neuvert, uh, G Gabriel Said Reynolds, the mass don't, are not interested, just like few people, liberal people. But why they are not interested? So there is a very good point in Arab world. They are not interested in anything outside of tradition. And also the political environment is a barrier may, uh, made between the West and East. So anything coming from the West is like in conspiracies, is like not belong to us. But, and what, the, uh, what are the approaches that attract or would attract Muslims? So if we, right now, if we can ask, so which books, in Western academia, translated or have attractions from Arab world. So one of them, the study Quran by Joseph Lombard, so has a good attraction from Arab world. Why? Because based on tafsir. And this is a very important thing. So it's not to think about the content, but because the idea of tafsir is the entrance to Quran. So, and this is a tradition. So if you are work inside Muslim tools, Muslim ulums, so then this is accepted. If outside, this will not be accepted. And you will see the Western approaches and uh, perspectives and how you can react. And you can see uh, very weird approaches uh, and here, and you can understand why uh, maybe Muslim world or Muslim people uh, are not interested. So the subject that um, I addressed is very complicated. Why? Because of the wide range of Western approaches. So there are different fields, different motivations, different agendas, different organizations, places, regions, scholars, and institutions' backgrounds. And I'll talk later about Karimi's work as an example. And then also the, the wide range of Islamic disciplines on the Quran, classical, medieval, modern, Asuyuti wars as an example. So when you talk about this, you cannot address this subject from one angle. So you need, so when, I, when you talk about Quran in the history department, it's different from religious department, from divinity department, or sociology. And also when you talk about Quran in the lens of Ilm al-Kalam, different from usul, from tafsir, from hadith. So you need to be aware and which field and on which basis you are talking about Quran. So this is a book by Murtada Karimi, an Iranian scholar. His book called Bibliography of Quranic Studies in European, in European Languages, 800 pages. So, and that covers from uh, 16th centuries till now. So, and excluding translations. So just works on Quran without translations. So 800 pages to map out all works on Quranic studies just in Europe, not in US. And the second book, Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Quran, I mentioned in the, this uh, edition, 2,500 pages based on at least 200 resources. So any manuscript you don't find, mostly in Ulum al-Qur'an, you will find it here 
in al itqan So this is the importance and the significance of a suyuti. So when you read a suyuti, when you have any book of suyuti, you have a lot of books. You don't have just his book. And then he mentioned in his introduction all resources. So the, the privilege of reading suyuti or you having like suyuti is this. This as I see, I think from Saudi Arabia, Majma' al-Malik Fahid li tiba'at al-Mus'haf al-Sharif. And I want to uh, talk about this edition. Thank you. This is a very good edition. And Tahqiq is very good. So Muhaqqiq, he uh, uh, provided uh, good uh, resources, and especially on any book provided by uh, a Suyuti, sometimes like just a Suyuti mention a book, but this book is published or not published. So this book is very good for, to know the history of Ulum al-Quran and also if any book published or not published. Makhtout is a manuscript or Matbu' is published. And also he has a good index of around 500 pages. And uh, so the book is around 3,000 pages. So uh, when you read al suyuti you read uh, the history of any field. When you read al ashbah wa nazair by al suyuti you don't read al ashbah wa nazair just for al suyuti You read the history, and he uh, is very uh, interested in the history of any field. So the first one who banned a book on this subject, and then the second one, the third one, and so this uh, uh, this aspect in a Suyuti's book. It's very important to for for any student. So in the beginning, in the introduction of uh, Karimi's book, uh, written by Andre Rabin, is uh, uh, he passed away just one years ago, and he is in the history department. He he wrote this and to describe Karimi's book. It, it, referring to Karimi, it shows that the Quran has truly entered the canon of world lit literature, subject to analysis through a wide range of methods, approaches, and presuppositions. It also uncovers a hopeful message for the future. So after 800 pages, so, so for the with academia, so they reach Quran as so they cannot ignore the book. And why? Because more specifically, so Anglican Overt, uh, her project, I can say, is a political project because her endeavor to make Quran as a European source not as an Arab source or Muslim source. What, why? Because cons uh, she considered Quran came in a late antiquity era. And what does that mean? Late antiquity era between the third and sixth century. And in these centuries, there are societies, Jewish, Christian, Arab, and others. And when Quran revealed, he addressed and talked and argued with others, Christian and Jewish. So he, she considered Quran a source for Jewish and Christian. So if we want to know the theology, because Quran engaged in theology of like Jewish and Christian. So if we want to know the, about the, uh, the new theology, we need to focus on Quran. So that means if we, we, we want to know about our resources as European, we need to make Quran a new resources. So Quran should be a resource for any European person, but based on European interpretation, not on Arab interpretation. And we'll see how she approaches this. So, but late antiquity is a very important uh, uh, era in the history of the West. And I just met the one who coined this uh, term, 
at Penn State University. His, his age right now around 90. His name is Peter Brown. And who was the first, the first one wrote, wrote about late antiquity term and all of this stuff. So in late antiquity, as you see, so Islam just within a few years moved from tribes in Arab Peninsula and, and spread in everywhere. So that's very important for everyone. What happened at that time? And how this changed? And then the question about Quran. What's the message in this Quran and how this happened? And then we need to focus on late antiquity as an era or uh, to re-study the history of Europe and re-study us as European based on this era, late antiquity. And before I continue, just like I want to pause for any question so far. Yes. Okay, so Andrew Rabin is a, a Western scholar who his approach, uh, I'm going to, to talk later about all of this stuff. stuff. Uh, he adopts uh, the historical criticism. He approaches the Quran on, based on history, historical and uh, philological. I'll talk about this later. And Angelica Neuvert uh, also is a scholar who worked on Quran in philological lens. What does that mean? It's just like to search and uh, study the history of Quran, how Quran evolved, how Quran uh, became as we have it right now, and what's the difference between Quran and Mus'haf, and what's the first Quran, and the history of uh, Quranic manuscripts. And this uh, may be the main subject we will talk later. Maybe the, um, we'll take a lot of uh, slides here. Uh, yeah, sure. So we say academia is just like wide term, more than like orientalist. So you can see, like in Western academia, some people like write, writing uh, in Orientalist lens or outside. Yeah. Any question, uh, David, from the audience? Okay. So here, just like general. Uh, uh, remarks on Western history and Muslim world. So we can uh, see right now, especially in uh, Western academia, mostly interested in uh, Middle East. It's important. Uh, Middle East is important, but not the heritage. They ignore the heritage. It's important right now, in modern time. But about the heritage, it's maybe not important. It's just like maybe in some, in some uh, departments. Why? Because uh, Western philosophy based on three epistemes. So we can see the three epistemes, Greek, Christian, and modern. They ignore the shift and everything, the translation have been uh, written by Arab from Greek and to the Western world. And now the Western world defined as Judeo-Christian world. And that's very important. And I've heard that the, the biggest victory for Jews in this time is to, to, to build or to shape the West as Judeo-Christian. And this, like, based on theology and law and everything, like, change in uh, Judaism based on this um, a new form. So, so but... What about the middle, uh, about the Arab scholars and the heritage of Islam and everything, the significance of Maimonides and uh, Thomas Aquinas? And here I can speak about the importance of the new philology, the traditional philology 
uh, versus new philology. So traditional philology used by German scholars in 19th century and 20th century as a tool to dig into and to, uh, to explain the history of Quran and coming as a colonial tool. So just like to speak about the history of any text, okay, the hist now the book that you have is not the book that in the history. This is different. And we know more than you. So something coming by a student of Anglican Oivert, Islam Day, a Jordanian scholar, right now teaching at uh, Freiburg Berlin University, and his project called in Germany the uh, Kant Philologie, the future of philology. So he understand he just used philology as a tool to counter philology. Okay, if we speak about philology, because the philology here as da, as like uh, marad, sickness. Okay, we use this da as dawa, medicine. Okay, let us work on philology and see how the Western world came or be become as we have right now. Let us speak about the heritage. Let us speak about Ibn Khaldun, and let us speak about Ghazali, and let us speak about Razi, and let us speak about Maimonides, uh, Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas, and all of these Western scholarship houses uh, become uh, 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 like Western. And so the, the Kant philology is to work on this shift, to work on this shift in medieval time. Okay, we need to dig into Western manuscripts and Western scholarship and to see the origins and resources all of this uh, uh, philosophy. So that's why Edward Said's uh, return to philology here is important. So return to philology here is a tool to counter the oldest philology. So let us back to philology as a tool as a medicine for the oldest philology. So right now, we can see a new generation at some universities interested in a new philology, like we see new philologists. And what does that mean now is abroad, like working on the history of uh, Arab printing in 19th centuries and 20th centuries, like when the Arab started uh, to be interested in Ibn Taymiyyah and what the editions of uh, and uh, the importance of Sheikh Tahir al Jazairi and his manuscripts. So, this, the new philology right now is very important to, to work on all of these manuscripts and how Uloom moved and shaped and how we see some, uh, some philosophy or like Western or Eastern, how it is shaped and on which basis. So I, I, I spoke about the, the complex and the subject, is, I said, is complicated. Why? Because here you can see a lot of perspectives, Western approaches and Islamic disciplines. So I speak about the Western approaches. Here you can see the list of Western approaches. And then I will speak about Islamic disciplines when we speak about Quran. So the first one, when we say Quran in Western academia, so the first and main methodology is to speak about historical criticism. So most scholars, you can categorize under this approach. They use the historical criticism as a tool to, to search for the Ur text. What does that mean, Ur text? The first text. So yes, we have Mus'haf right now, but what about Quran? What about Al-Kitab that mentioned in the book? What about Dhikr? And what about uh, Mus'haf Ali? And what about Mus'haf Abu uh, Ubay? What about Mus'haf Ibn Mas'ud? And to, to follow all of these and to find what the Ur text 
And here we will talk about this uh, later about the ortex and historical criticism. And the second one, philology and new philology, and I spoke about the, the Comte philology. The Comte is a future and philology is a philology. And then the thematic approach is just like focus on Quran based on themes. And that means maybe to re, uh, uh, mostly to think in Quran in a chronological way, not based on Mus'haf. To come to Quran in the lens of Makki and Madani, in the history of Quran. So we cannot understand the themes of Quran we don't under, without understanding the history of the subject in, or the evolution of the subject, how the subject is evolved during the prophet's time and then the uh, semitic languages and rhetoric and this uh, i'm going to talk about this as a second main uh, uh, subject so here there are some especially in the 70s of uh, 20th century talk about the origins of the quran so many, many words in the Quran coming from Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, and outside the Quran. And the main work by Christopher Luxembourg, and who I call Albani of Western Scholarship. What does that mean? So they are in each field Albani. And in each field, Christopher Columbus, uh, Christopher Luxembourg. The one who just make eyes open. And then people like engage, is he a scholar or not a scholar? And yeah, and Awam consider him a scholar, but Ahlul Tahqiq, no, not a scholar. This happening in each field. But this like as a message from like Allah and just like to make people rebuild the ulum. Okay, Alm al-Hadith in the 20th century is just like, and then Albani came and everything changed and you can see that in Alm al-Kalam and Alm al-Tafsir and al fiqh Usul al-Fiqh and in each field there is Albani that doesn't mean I don't give privilege uh, to Albani I don't speak about Albani here uh, but just like I say there is a movement in each field by this person on the theater like coming just like flash and then make everything working, monitor. And then to speak about the origin and genealogy of the text in different lens. I here to speak about language and text, the biblical text. Okay, so Quran is just a book derived from biblical text. And this is a new approach also. I'll talk about this maybe, I think the second or the third. I, I'll, I'll categorize all of these in four main uh, perspectives later. And also, when you talk about uh, Western approach, you, speak, uh, you should talk about colonialism and post-colonialism, and also to, to read Quran in literary lens, and also late antiquity I mentioned already, and also semantic field. And here, this accepted by Muslim scholars right now, and especially in Arab academia. So everything coming from this approach right now accepted by a new generation in Arab world. And especially by, I'll talk later about a Japanese scholar, his name Toshihiko Izotso. So he works on Quran in the lens of like semantic lens, and he presented a very important book, translated his book in different, like a couple of editions and a couple of works and just a new documentary on his life released one week ago. And he, uh, uh, st his students uh, mostly from, uh, uh, from uh, Muslim world, especially from Iran. <coughs> Uh, is, is also? The I'm sorry. The okay. I, I mentioned an example. Yes. This later. Okay. 
just like here to to mention all of these uh, 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 approaches. And then there is a ring theory. Ring theory is a very uh, new theory uh, to 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 approach Quran based on surah. Each surah is a ring. And this based on mushaf, based on what we have, not based on chronological reading. So we read Surah Yusuf as we have it in mushaf and as a ring. And I'll talk about this in the last main approach. And also to speak about Quran in Musa Academia, you should be aware about the field of inscriptions and manuscripts and material evidence. And this is a very big right now after Birmingham discovery. The, the oldest uh, manuscript and also Sana'a uh, manuscripts. And also to speak about Islam in Western academia and Quran specifically, you should talk about anthropology. Everything about anthropology right now in Western academia when you speak about uh, religion and speak about Muslim and Islam. And in the end, uh, there are some approaches on coherence and nazm. Uh, this came in a bit earlier. Question from Zahra Moini. She asks, Salam alaikum, to what extent do you think Angelica Neuwirth's approach to the Quran is aligned with an Islamic view of the Quran? Though it is more friendly and welcoming to the Islamic view, from my readings of her works, it seems she is still involved in a project of historicizing the Quran as an quote unquote object of late antiquity, or at least an episode within a development of Christian Jewish theology. Right. So Angelika Neuwirth is uh, uh, accepted widely among, uh, especially. Uh, scholars in uh, in Arab academia and Muslim academia right now and especially because to they understand the approach by Angelica Neuvert as a political movement a political uh, or motivated by political to make Quran available for European uh, for European people and how she addressed this uh, she used a lot of tools one of these she said, 70s and Christian people ruin the field of the Quran. That's in the 70s and after the world, uh, world War II and World War I, after the Jewish scholars uh, persuaded from uh, Western academia after Nazi war. So she thinks we need to go to the Jewish methodology based on hermeneutics and all of their uh, approaches to work on the Quran. So the same uh, approach used by Jewish on Torah, we need to use the same on Quran. And this is the project of Corpus Quranicum. She, she, she thinks we have the same fate, Jewish and Muslim, on hermeneutics and to understand the text. So from this lens, Muslims don't accept that. But for late antiquity, most mostly Muslim understand the idea of late antiquity because Muslim aware about Sira and how the movement and everything change very rapidly. So they understand the importance of late antiquity and why we understand and why we need to 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 to, to study Quran in late antiquity and what happened that time. But if we speak about Ur text. And we speak about a lot of things for Zahra, and especially the main, uh, the main uh, uh, approach, and this will be maybe addressed next Tuesday, we will talk about Neuvert specifically, about some cases. I think it would be good to address this gradually, later, step by step, and to see where we can see Neuvert and her works because her works based on chrono chronological reading and Jewish hermeneutics and Quran as a, a late antique text. Okay.
And then here, uh, I, th I think at 8.15, uh, we should finish. Okay, so I'll just, I'll finish this and then we'll stop with the question, okay. So that's, that's a very important question. So Jewish hermeneutics and different from tafsir. So Jewish hermeneutics different here like from what we have in traditional like Judaism, like how to approach, uh, approach Torah. I speak about modern hermeneutics. It's not about traditional. I, I don't speak about traditionalist Jewish. I speak about hermeneutics in modern Jewish world. And that's me to discover the old text, to discover the history of text. And that's not the way of traditionalist in like Judaism. So to speak about the literary and how the 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 the, the, the text shaped and the history of text. And uh, so mostly this started by German scholar, by Abraham Geiger, Noltke, and then Neuwert is a new, uh, a new uh, movement in this series. So, okay, another question? Okay, so just I'll uh, go over this uh, slide and then I'll stop with uh, questions. So here to speak about Islamic disciplines, when you go to uh, Quranic studies, you should carry all of these tools on your, on your uh, shoulders to speak or to, to, to study Quran. The first one, tafsir discipline, exegesis, and ilm tafsir So we cannot say that ilm tafsir started early. So for us, Yuti said, the first book written on ilm tafsir written by uh, his Shaykh al-Khafaji and also al-Bulqini. That means in the uh, ninth Islamic century. And also Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a book on Qawaid al-Tafsir or Muqaddimah fi Usul al-Tafsir. Like as a genre, ilm al-Tafsir, we don't see that. Until the, like the book here, Asyuti al-Tahbir fi ilm al-Tafsir. Do you see ilm al-Tafsir here as a title? Al-Tahbir fi ilm al-Tafsir. And then Ulum al-Quran also is a late also discipline. Uh, start as a genre by Zarkashi al-Burhan and reached the big by uh, al-Itqan, which, uh, which is an introduction to his tafsir, Majma' al-Bahrain. And also when you study Quran, you need to know about Qira'at. Not to memorize Qira'at, but the history of Qira'at, to map Qira'at. And also Gharib al-Qur'an. And that means to know Arabic languages, dialects, and foreign languages. What does that mean, foreign languages? We will speak that later, about that later. Some scholars said in Qur'an there are at least 50 languages. Arab al-Qur'an, that means syntax, hermeneutics, and explaining meaning. And you will discover Arab is not a grammar for Mufassirin. So when they say Aribu al-Quran, that doesn't mean to understand Arab and Nahu, different. And Mufradat al-Quran and Wujuh wa nazair we'll talk about this later. And also Wujuh wa nazair there is another term called Al-Huruf al-Musarrafa. This is a genre called Al-Huruf al-Musarrafa or Al-Wujuh wa nazair And Wujuh wa nazair here different from Fiqh. And it's a, a, a very unique term in Ilm al-Qur'an, al-Wujuh al nazair in terms of Mufradat al-Qur'an. And also to understand Rasm al-Qur'an, orthography. And to understand the history of Masahif and the history of Mus'haf and Dotology. This a term, I don't know if just I coined to use <laughs> Dotology is how we can, but Dots. Okay, so for bait, do you see bait? But yeah, if you take all dots and all 
uh, vowels, how many possibilities you have? Around 70. Okay? Around 70. And then you will see a tool used by orientalists right now to read Quran without dots and without vowels. They come and put the text without dots and without vowels. And then <laughs> how you can read that? So if you give that to Arab, and now you can see in social media, in Arab, like social media, they put that. And they say, do you know how they are Arab, like clever and read all the whole text without dots? And puts just like a quiz for anyone, a text without dots and, and uh, vowels. And you, when you read that, mean you understand Arabic. And this, you see, for some, for some word, maybe 70 possibilities. Like especially for ba yata or these letters, because for ba, it's five letters. Ba, ya, noon, ta, and tha, could be. And another one. But the last one, this one, just three options. And with three vowels in the beginning and four vowels in the middle with sukun and three vowels in the end, multiply everything, that's 70. So dotology and cardiocology about manuscripts and how you can deal with manuscripts. And ishtiqaq, oh, that's very big. Ishtiqaq sagheer, ishtiqaq kabir, and ishtiqaq akbar. The fiqh al-lugha. Fiqh al-lugha huwa al-ishtiqaq. How you can uh, understand ishtiqaq and how you can uh, uh, um, uh, connect the words based on ishtiqaq. And also sarf. You can say morphology, and some people use morphology for nahu, but uh, sarf mostly uh, uh, concerned about the entire world, word, is not the end, not the ending case. And hadith criticism. Maybe you will ask a question. So we have a lot of reports in these lectures, and then reports, so then how Muslim scholars criticize these reports because maybe for you, maybe the first time you see this like tradition. Is that what we have in Itqan? Yes, but then there are some scholars who criticize all of these, which Orientalists don't accept. This is a struggle, this is a war. Hadith is a war. Hadith is, uh, I'm sorry, not Hadith is the war. I'm sorry, Hadith is the tool in the war between the two camps. If you go from inside, if you have Hadith, Hadith as mustalah is a very important equipment, weapon. And also Hadith as text. And that's what we said in the history of Islam. If anyone yujadiluka and argue with bid'ah, alayka bil Hadith, not Quran. Because Hadith can discover everything. So hadith is two tools, as a text and as a terminology, both of them. And then in the end, there are other uloom, like usul al-deen, uh, usul al-fiqh, and al-fiqh. And I'll stop here if you have any questions. Uh, if you don't have any questions, and I'll... See if we have time to. Yes, Dr. Batsayed. That's a very good question. So I think the first volume translated a very bad translation. And there is an initiative right now at Vanderbilt University with a professor, Richard McGregor, uh, with some scholars to work on this. And I understood, I understood that Alexander Nish from Michigan University is working at uh, translating a Suyuti right now with some scholars. Alexander working on the history of Tasawwuf and uh, Tasawwuf generally. Yes, Afandar. Right. That's a very good question. So 
Alum al-Qur'an is same as another genre, is ca called Alum al-Hadith, right? Or Mustalah al-Hadith. And why Mustalah al-Hadith started very early? Because Mustalah al-Hadith based on what? Based on Isnad. So Qur'an, we don't need Isnad. So mostly on Matin. And when we speak about Matin, so what, where's the Matin of Alum al-Qur'an? Tafsir. So tafsir is uh, working on the matin. But ulum al-Qur'an as a genre, but ulum al-Qur'an doesn't like speak about isnad and all of these techniques. So then we see in tafsir many scattered subjects, like here and there. At-Tabari mentioned some, Al-Razi mentioned some, Al-Baydawi, Al-Zamakhshari, and then all of these combined. And the first book, as Suyuti said, the first book written on Alam al-Qur'an, Funun al uh, Funun al uh, uh, I think Funun al-Afnan by Ibn al-Jawzi, but he said nothing about Alam al-Qur'an. It's just about, we cannot say that Alam al-Qur'an. And then he said the first book written on Alam al-Qur'an is al zarkashi Why is this later? I think, and maybe there are some different uh, reasons for this. I think because the idea uh, for ilm here is to focus on the, the way of narrating or the content. And the way of narrating for ulama is not important to speak about how we narrate Quran because that's mutawatir and outside of, uh, out of questions. But it seems in al-Itqan is not out. We need to address this. So around 700 pages in Al-Itqan to speak about Isnad in Quran and to speak about Qira'at. And he addressed all of these important questions that we have right now. So now if I ask you, is Quran mutawatir? You say yes. And then if I ask you, is Qira'at mutawatira? It's another question. Mus'haf mutawatir? And huruf al-sab'a mutawatira? And, uh, and then Qira'at al-sab'a? Okay, all of these questions addressed by al itqan And we see a very rich discussion by ulama on all of these questions. And now, if we, we read these, inshallah, we will see that's mentioned by a Suyuti, mentioned in different resources. Everything here I will mention by a Suyuti is based on resources. And some resources in the third century, like Al Masahif by Ibn Abi Dawood, Ibn Ashta, or uh, to speak about Mus'haf Osman, or, or all of these. So we see that all of these are scattered in many places, but not under the genre of Ulum al Quran. Okay, some under the Rasm, some under the, the history of Mus'haf, some under the, the Qira'at, Ahruf al Sab'a, Al Lugat fil Quran, and so on. But then a Suyuti combine all of these and give uh, uh, the, the title Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran, but uh, I said preceded by Al Zarkashi, Al, al Burhan fi Ulum al Quran. I don't know if my answer match your question, but however, I said, maybe the, I, I said there are different reasons for this. And uh, we can think about that maybe now and second lecture and why. And we see like different resources, but why that's not an early, uh, an early book. Uh, Mohsin Ali asks, what is the difference between Ulum al-Quran and Ilm al-Tafsir as disciplines? That's good. So Ulum al-Quran to speak about not the text. So Ilm al-Tafsir right now is derived mainly from علم الدلالات الأصولية to speak about اقتضاء, إشارة, نص, ظاهر and this علم التفسير so then when علم التفسير we speak about تفسير and تأويل and تفسير and تأويل as, uh, as uh, a specific terms in أصول الفقه or as a general terms so علم التفسير is about what we call interpretation and hermeneutics but علم القرآن to speak about how the history of Quran, speak about the history of Quran, the history of Qira'at and Qurra, reciters, the history of reciters, Tabaqat al-Qurra, 
Rasim, Makki, Madani, this is different from Ilm al-Tafsir. So when you go like to see Ilm al-Tafsir by Ibn Taymiyyah, Muqaddimah fi Usul al-Tafsir, we don't see anything about Qira'at and Qurra and Makki and Madani. But we see that Al-Muhkamu is this and that, and Al-Mutashabih is this and that, and Nas is this and that, and how we can understand the text if they contradict each other. The idea of Ta'arud and how we can uh, compare the text. This is the idea of Tafsir and this is the idea of Ilm al-Qur'an. So this, they are different genres. There are some subjects overlapped, but mostly Al-Itqan is Al-Bahr al-Muhit. And Al-Itqan bring all Ulum to his Al-Itqan. So in Al-Itqan, what you can see? Al-Itqan, you can study Al-Balagha, the whole Balagha. If you just don't want, if you don't want to bring to your library any book on Balagha, bring Al-Itqan. There are around 600 pages on Al-Balagha. If you don't study Arab, bring Al-Itqan. If you don't bring uh, any book with Arab, bring Al-Itqan. And same with like Hadith and many, many things. A question from Javed Achalia. He asks, you mentioned about Al-Iqan. What is the difference between the new edition and the old? Would the old edition belong to Suyuti, whereas the new has been added by contemporary scholars? I understand. The, I, I'm sorry. What is the difference between the old edition of, of Al-Iqan and the new edition? Uh, English or? He doesn't specify. It's Khan. Mm -hmm. It's a question about yes. it's Khan. So, so always, always the general, the general. Uh, He's asking about the Arabic. He just clarified. Uh, about Arabic, yeah. So I, I don't know if I, I can recall anything I said about uh, new edition and uh, old edition. Did did I speak about it Khan or another book? Yeah, right. I don't speak about old edition and a new edition of al -Itqan. Yeah, I, just I said this edition, but I don't compare this edition with others. I said this good edition. But always, if there is an Hajari, like this Indian, like old Indian uh, edition, if you find any, any of this, like Hajari or like uh, old edition, the best. He says the old edition he has is only two volumes. And what's, uh, who's the editor? <laughs> By Al Kashif Sayyidi. He said yes. He said yes to. Yes for what? I think Sayyidi. Kashif Sayyidi. Is that what you said? Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, however, I recommend this uh, edition uh, just for because when Al Itqan and the Suyuti works needs uh, a very good editor to give a context for all resources he mentioned, and this good because when a Suyuti mention any book, the editor he like uh, and uh, write this book is published or unpublished and uh, and when published or 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 that, and that's why we need. Uh, can we have okay? Last question. Last question. Yes, Tafadha. Uh, and what the who is the muhaqiq? I think a group uh, here called Markaz al Dirasat al Quraniya. Markaz al Dirasat al Quraniya. So could be. Like uh, maybe two, three, four, but I think Markaz al Dirasat Qur'aniya uh, publishing good, good works in uh, in Saudi Arabia. And based on my reading, I, I found this tahqiq is is good. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Anyway, if you have any question uh, during this week, just uh, write and prepare. We can start the next uh, lecture with the questions and continue, inshallah, with the slides. Assalamu alaikum.